And let's begin. Welcome everyone to the second and final class. This class is gonna be focused on helping you get an A for your participation grade. So I encourage people to do a lot of voting. We're gonna be looking at case studies and I'm gonna be asking your opinion. There are no right or wrong answers on the case studies that I have come up with. So everyone's opinion matters and everyone opinion, everyone's opinion is gonna be valued. So I would love it if cameras opened up. That's not required, but it's always fun to see who I'm gonna be meeting in a few weeks. Also, uh, raising hands and participating in class is great. You can also do it into the chat room. Uh, when we do the voting, it will be in the participant section where you see everyone's names Bottom left, you'll be voting the green yes or the red no. If that's not available to you for some reason, especially if you're on mobile, then you can just write it into the chat. So before we begin, does anyone have any questions before we start into the lecture? The first hour is gonna be case studies and voting. Uh, the last half hour is gonna be anyone that wants to talk to me about their actual project. So if no one has any questions, uh, we'll actually be popping out a little bit early and again, let me put in my private email, uh, which gets to me faster than any other email. You can also put attachments in there. I'm also gonna put in my cell phone. Uh, text me any time of day, that's absolutely encouraged, because uh, my job is to make sure that your projects do well. And if what I would like to see is at least five pieces of participation either writing something meaningful in the chat, a few sentences, uh, anything more than is great or I like it would be wonderful. And also, uh, love it when people just raise their hand and, and talk to us. So, let's begin. And here we go. So again, for the final project, it's gonna be based on uh, pretty much how a standard startup goes. Uh, what is the problem that you're solving? What's the solution? Uh, why is blockchain the solution? Uh, please keep it simple. So try to keep it where someone like a kid could understand it, your younger brother, sister, mom or dad, regular person on the street. I prefer that people use simple language so that we can understand your idea. Uh, I do have a suggestion. This is not a requirement. Uh, if your blockchain is something that people need versus want or is a nice to have, then when you want to use this project in the real world for let's say a hackathon or actually do your startup, uh, you're going to have a higher probability of success with people needing it versus just wanting it. How do you make money? There's a few ways you can do that. One is just straight charging money and making revenue. If you're going to be inside of a corporation, making money could be making money for the bottom line, which would be reducing costs. So you could save time or money. That would be your value proposition. If it's a nonprofit, it could be something that is improving the quality of life for people. So basically, how are you adding value? So the, my definition of money is relative. Uh, how do you scale? How are you gonna grow this? For example, if you wanna do internet voting, uh, maybe you're gonna start out at you know, blockchain for Holt Student Council. You might bump that up to uh, another school council Maybe you're gonna bump that up to county elections and eventually you could do a national election. Uh, but scaling shouldn't really be a problem for blockchain since it's already on the techie side. And make sure that you can answer yes to all seven questions. Also in parentheses, uh, I gave you suggestions for ideas. You don't have to use those. You can come up with your own idea. I did that to give you some thoughts if you're kind of trying to figure out, well, how do I actually use this and come up with an idea? One thing that you may want to take a look at is some boring infrastructure solutions. A blockchain lends itself very well to government regulations saying, hey, you need to make more disclosure about this or that, and reporting. Uh, when the government comes out with some of those regulations, you can easily make a startup that says, hey, uh, we know that this is a new thing you have to comply with in 90 days. Uh, we have a really easy turnkey blockchain solution. Great way to start a business. Might not float the passion boat, might not be terribly interesting, but it could make an interesting blockchain solution. And remember, blockchain might do better in the back office than something flashy on the front end. Again, here is the blockchain decision path. The slides are already uploaded to Canvas, uh, so feel free to screenshot this. And I'm gonna dive right in here. So there's always a new startup. Now, SAP is trying to 
target counterfeit drugs in the blockchain, here's what they're trying to do. That pharmaceutical companies will make drugs, they send them out to the wholesalers, and then they don't always get used. So they send them back. And they want to know, since about $7 billion get returned, are we refunding people money on drugs that we actually made or these counterfeit? So putting on the, on the blockchain is important. Also, there's a pharma, there are pharmaceutical companies where they will put the drug on the blockchain, let's say that this is the drug here, with an expiration. But then the drug gets stolen, gets lost, and it goes off expiration. A counterfeiter will change the expiration and try to resell it. And if this is on the blockchain and you try to verify it, you could see that the manufacturer's expiration date doesn't match the expiration date that might be on the bottle. So this is what SAP is trying to do. So this is the software as a service. And a few of their goals is that they really want to try to also, on top of just this, transmit patient data to healthcare providers, pharmacies, insurance payers. So let's say my doctor gives me a prescription for a drug that is typically abused. Uh, that could securely go to the pharmacy. The pharmacy could then put on the blockchain, hey, Michael filled it, so now I can't go across the street and try to fill it again. My insurance provider could reimburse me for that uh, faster than normal uh, because they basically see all the information. Also, they are looking for blockchain-based trackers with unique identification of medicinal products. So think like a QR code is going to be on here and then you can track this through the supply chain and there is compliance with the u.s drug supply chain security act and now wholesalers have to verify prescription drugs that are returned or intended for resale so this i already chatted about just a minute or so ago again this is a great blockchain idea uh, from last class we came up with the idea of what if there was a public blockchain that would hold all the stolen drugs. So let's say a shipment gets stolen, immediately it can go on the blockchain as, hey, this shipment's been stolen, it didn't go to the place where it's supposed to be, uh, please don't buy this. So now let's say some a doctor innocently buys this, now when they hit the QR code, they see it's on the stolen blockchain, and that will allow them to know that maybe someone has tampered with it and they shouldn't be using it. And again, this is where startups can come up, because the government's always coming up with some sort of compliance thing. So before we vote, the vote is basically going to be, should we be putting drugs on the supply chain blockchain to track them for expiration and verification that they're authentic? Before we vote, is there anyone that would like to put in any opinions of, yeah, I think it's a really great idea, or no, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think blockchain is the solution. And again, this is the graded participation class. So raising a hand and just throwing out an opinion is great. We don't have to have uh, super duper uh, unique ideas, but we do like to have a conversation and a debate. Someone saying, I love it. Someone saying, I don't love it. So before we vote, feel free to raise a hand if you'd like to give us your opinion. Okay, so Benjamin says this is already being used in Europe. Excellent. Uh, Vignesh, and can you let me know if I'm pronouncing your name right? And could you unmute your mic? Uh, yes, Michael. I think it's uh, absolutely the right solution for this problem. Great, thank you. Any other hands that wanna chat about this? Okay, so let's get on to voting. So please go to the participants box and click yes. I think that using blockchain to track pharmaceutical drugs is a good idea or no, I don't, and you can put this, you can put your vote in the chat if you can't find that yes or no button. Okay, we've got 24 yeses and one no. Now, I always love to get counter arguments because sometimes there's something that we haven't thought of that we need to know about. So if anyone voted no, would you be willing to raise your hand and just share with us why you don't think it's a great idea? Maybe there's something that we're missing that you can share with us.
Marcus, could you share with us? I, I see you don't think it solves the problem, but would you be willing to expand on the class with us why you feel that way? Sure. I think the problem is more a societal uh, problem, and so it can't directly be solved with technology, but technology can, of course, help to um, solve the problem. But in itself, it's not a solution. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts before we move on to the next case study? Okay, moving right along. Again, here's the blockchain decision path again. I, I'd like to just sear this into everyone's consciousness because it really helps define whether you need it or not. Again, if you recall, I like to repeat myself a lot. Since this is new technology, I want to repeat what I feel is important, that great ideas can come from government regulations where they'll pop up and say, hey, you have to track this. Example, uh, what if the government all of a sudden says, anyone who is bringing a child into a public school system, you have to put their vaccination records on the blockchain. Certainly debatable about privacy and people's beliefs on that, but if there has to be immediate compliance within, let's say, 90 days because the school year is starting and that's now the law, some schools may not have the budget to technologically figure this out, and you could come along and say, hey, we've got an app for that. So remember, government regulations could be really great ground for coming up with really good ideas. So now we're gonna move into a case study where I'm gonna ask you for some critical thinking. This is actually happening, you see this started about three weeks ago. Ford Motor Company, they're looking to launch a blockchain pilot with IBM to make sure that there's ethical sourcing of cobalt. Okay, why are they doing that? Well, what's the problem? The problem is, is that children sometimes are used as child labor to mine the cobalt. Okay, why does Ford and IBM care about this? Because Ford is getting more into electric cars and every car battery is gonna need about 20 pounds of cobalt. Also laptops, like the one that I'm using for this class, needs about an ounce of it. And if you see on the bottom right, uh, there is a 800% growth demand forecast by 2026. So there's gonna be a lot more cobalt mined and used, much greater demand, and consumers, conscious consumers might say, I want to make sure that the car I'm buying is not promoting child labor. Now, the article basically spoke about the child labor issue uh, to a degree. Other students from, from the nano course uh, did add to the article that the problem with the child labor is not so much a safety issue, uh, like them getting sick. It's more an issue of they're not going to school because they're working at the home mine. Now, let's zoom in on the problem a little bit more. In blue, you'll see that the country of interest is really the Democratic Republic of Congo. They have some child labor in their mines. 60% of the world's cobalt is coming from this region. Now, 20% of this region has some child labor, and this is the smaller mines, the mom and pops, according to the article. 80% uh, of it is produced by industrial mines, and that does not, according to the article, seem to be their focus. Their focus is on the 20%, the smaller mines. And they're trying to use blockchain to trace it in the supply chain to say, hey, was this cobalt used from the, the labor of children or was it ethically mined by adults? So here's what they're trying to do for the solution. They want to basically trace and validate ethically sourced minerals. That's, that's the big idea. But here are some challenges. With these informal mines, how are you going to monitor that? Are they connected to the internet? Are they going to be able to comply with this? Do they use computers? The article actually doesn't get into this, but it's, it's, a, it's one of the challenges. This is a tech solution. And in the Congo, do they have the tech infrastructure for compliance. Now, you're going to be needing to transmit electronic data. Uh, are you going to be able to do that in a remote area? The last point is that there's some corruption and lawlessness in this country historically. Uh, are you going to be having issues where maybe it's dangerous to have auditors there? Or it's, maybe there's going to be some bribing. How do you really know? Especially with metals that can be perhaps melted into ethical metals. It's kind of like blood diamonds, it's the same challenge. So the question comes, can blockchain really figure this out? Well, the partnership 
is going to be between Ford Motor Company, company who wants the batteries and they want their consumers to feel good about buying their products and IBM who's actually going to be coding on the blockchain and RC, RCS Global they're going to be the validators think of them as like auditors people who make a business out of saying hey the data is going on the blockchain correctly if they don't get it right they lose a big account if they do get it right they can grow on to maybe other companies like Mercedes or Volvo. So they do have an incentive to get it right. However, who are these people and why should we trust them? Now I have asked, uh, I do informal guest speakers on blockchain and two people that said yes to me was uh, Dr. Garrett who runs RCS Global in New York. He agreed to speak with us. And then Manish Chawla from IBM He's actually going to be coding it, and of course, this is great business for IBM. So we want to ask them questions live. Hey, is blockchain really going to work for this? Now, this is actually a picture I grabbed off the internet of children mining cobalt in the Congo. So assuming that this picture is actually valid, this is, this is what it looks like. It's basically children of people who own the mine. And again, the big problem here is that they're not going to school because they're working in the mine. Now, the project is actually relatively small. It's proof of concept. So the cobalt that's going to be produced in one industrial mine in the DRC is going to be the example. And they're going to trace it from mine to smelter. Uh, after it is smelted, then they're going to be tracking it into South Korea where it goes into an actual battery. Then they're going to trace it into the Ford plant. And you've got this nice little trail. And they basically say that this is going to help with compliance for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So, sounds okay. Big question is, how do you know that it's ethically mined before it goes on the blockchain? The article doesn't really get into that. However, uh, here are some of your key players. So, Dr. Garrett, he's going to be the validator. So, he's the one that wants to make sure that good things are happening, and he feels that he's impartial because he doesn't care one way or the other. He's being paid to do accurate information. Now you've got traditionally the miners and smelters, they've all relied on third-party audits. So now this might be able to make things a little bit cheaper by having blockchain replace the auditors, maybe, or help the auditors in their process. Now IBM is in the yellow box. Uh, they want to make the first mineral supply chain. So this could open them up to tracking other minerals or other commodities in the supply chain if this thing works. And again, what they're really trying to do is have an open democratic supply chain blockchain uh, that's going to be in compliance with OECD, which is their governing body. So here are a couple challenges. And I want to know what you think so that I can give you all an A for your participation grade. And you can either raise your hand or go into the chat box, but how do you, how are you really gonna make sure that that cobalt on the blockchain really didn't touch a child's hand? Like what's blockchain actually gonna do? How are you gonna do that? Any ideas how we're actually gonna make sure that the cobalt is clean going on? And what if you get some bad cobalt, or let's say child labor cobalt, and you mix it in with the good stuff that was ethically mined? How do you know now? Because I don't know if it's been melted down. Uh, Marcus, what do you think? Um, I know with some minerals or metals that are mined, you can trace them back to the mine by just analyzing them chemically because from every mine, the minerals are slightly different. And so they've got a um, fingerprint that could be stored on a blockchain or wherever to trace it. Back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Reza, I see your hand is up. Uh, yes, I think just like in the chocolate industry and uh, garment industry, there needs to be a entity or a body that uh, that will validate everything uh, and make sure that there's like a like a stamp for it, you know. Uh, but in any case, there should be a third party entity to validate everything uh, from the source. Okay, thank you, Aida. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I agree with what Reza said. Um, it's just that to me, there has to be someone on site to make sure that everything is, is, is doing, everyone is doing the thing right because 
otherwise, I don't see how they're going to make sure that um, there's no, no no child working on on it. I don't I don't I don't see how they can make sure no no child is actually working if there's no third party or like someone on site. So. Uh, w would you feel comfortable if maybe there was like a security camera that was on twenty four seven, and maybe AI is taking a look at the size of the workers? You know, basically, to make it really simple, small workers versus big workers, perhaps that's child versus adult. Would that be helpful? Yeah. I mean, it, this can be a solution. Um, I like definitely prefer this because we have to know in some ways like what's going on there. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Aida. Uh, now we'll take a look at the chat. Uh, so we have one person who's, who's asking, can this be used to identify irregularities or to identify international criminal activities such as drug trade or something like that? You could certainly twist this to basically you're trying to identify that there are the goods that are going onto the blockchain are what they say they are. You could use this to make sure that it, with the same idea that it really is a Louis Vuitton product. Uh, and not a counterfeit product. So yeah, you can certainly uh, shift blockchain around like that. That would be more in a, a, into a, like a different kind of blockchain. It would still be supply chain, but it'd be more like a provenance. And then we've got just stuff importing from these countries. Yes, that would be a solution, except uh, they're one of the largest suppliers in the world. And there's an 800% increase in demand. So their challenge is that they may have to do business with this region whether they want to or not. That seems to be the, the crux of why they're doing this. Uh, increase the penalty that the country uses. Okay, now this is interesting. This is actually a different solution that doesn't need blockchain. So let's say that maybe the country's doing that or perhaps instead of a penalty, which we could do, we're looking for compliance, uh, maybe you give people some great incentive to send their kid to school, maybe some incentive that outweighs uh, going into the mine because maybe, maybe as children, they don't really produce as much as an adult. That could possibly be something. Uh, literacy rate, uh, perhaps you put a school there on site and say maybe culturally it's okay in this country to have child labor. I don't know. Well, let's say that the country says, hey, this is sort of what we do. And we go, well, we'd be more comfortable if we could make sure that your, your child's getting educated all right, well, maybe we put a school there and then everyone could be happy. I don't know. I'm throwing out ideas here. Uh, what else? Okay. I don't think blockchain will solve the child labor problem. Uh, the reason that child labor in COBOL is their family needs them to earn some money. If the child labor can't go to the mines, they'll go somewhere else. Interesting point. If they don't go to COBOL, they'll go work somewhere else. They can't go to school anyhow. Okay, so interesting that maybe this is just kicking it down down the road that they're going to work somewhere, whether it's here or there, they're not going to go to school anyhow. Perhaps that is the case. So you're really not solving the problem. You're just shifting it. That could be true. It's hard to ensure 100% no child's been involved uh, with the IR argument. Yeah, exactly. It could be tough to connect this to the internet. So all wonderful thoughts. And oh, I love the last one. Corruption can be creative. <laughs> Yeah, actually, there was an organization that was ranking the most creative industries in the world, and I believe the number one creative creative industry was the mafia. Uh, so anyhow, go figure on that one. So let's pull out the vote. So let's do the yes or no button. Do you think that using blockchain to get child labor out of the cobalt mines is a good idea? Yes or no? And you, if, you have, if you're on the I don't know plan, uh, please put, us into, put that into the chat, what you're, why you're not saying yes or no, or perhaps what you're, what you're struggling with. And again, voting is a really easy way to get participation points. Also, in the chat, anyone can save the chat. You just go to where you type in your, your information. Uh, bottom right, little button says more. Just click that on that, and you can save the chat. Okay, so we have 15 yeses and 14 noes. So raise a hand if you said yes and you would like to share with us why you said yes.
again, is an opportunity to get some participation points because Michael likes to give A's. Okay, no takers. Raise your hand if you'd like to share with us why you say no, why blockchain is not the solution. Benjamin, hi, welcome to the show. Hello, can you listen to me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, well, um, after thinking this deeply, I think that uh, the issue is more about how we can um, incentivize the company to try to take these kids out or the families out more than tracking this cobalt through all the, um, the supply chain. I think it's more more related with social than with supply chain issue. So I don't think this will work even though we don't apply like social incentives or like schools, like you said. I think it's not only um, blockchain. Okay, thank you, Benjamin. Welcome. And if anyone has any other thoughts, feel free to please put them in the chat because I do read that afterwards. So now, this is gonna be our last slide and we're gonna be voting and talking about these different industries. So let's take a look at quick payment processes. That one of the blockchain ideas that's in the FinTech space is that you can transfer money without a bank or an existing bank can help you transfer money with the blockchain. Uh, please share with us your thoughts. Do you think this is a good idea or a bad idea? Using blockchain to wire money across the world, using your smartphone, good idea, bad idea? Aida, hi. Hi. Uh, to me, it's definitely a good idea because it will reduce um, the, some costs. I mean, having an intermediary is just like uh, adding more um, more costs and it takes more time. Like the people that have to make sure the records are correct, it can take up to like two, three days. And having blockchain is definitely going to help uh, saving time. So. Okay, thank you. And I see in the chat... I might not say your name right, but I'll try. Kai, uh, do we need to buy a token first in order to transfer the money? No, you don't necessarily need to use tokens in this transaction at all. If I'm, let's say, a Bank of America customer and I use blockchain to send it to another Bank of America customer, don't need a token. Also, yes, it can reduce costs, facilitate for government agencies, Okay, any other thoughts before we start to take a vote on payments? All right, yes, I like blockchain for payments, or no, I don't like blockchain for payments. Please vote. And it appears that Reyes is going to say yes because his parents can send him money faster. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. Okay, so we have 27 yeses and two noes. For extra participation points, the people that voted no, would you be willing to raise your hand and share with us why not? Because maybe there's something that we're missing. Maybe there's a danger that we need to be aware of. Because remember, blockchain's not perfect. So anyone who said no, would you be willing to share with us? Vignesh. Uh, hi, Michael. Hi. So, I mean, cryptocurrencies were the first thing that criminals were using on the dark web to basically transfer money for drugs or guns or, you know, even human trafficking. So having banking systems basically made it easy to, to restrict these trading transactions. And uh, this would just make it extremely easy for criminal activity at the same time it's also very very good because it takes away the cost of infrastructure for and it reduces uh, the cost for other people who are using it for good purposes but i think it will be first applied to all the wrong purposes first okay thank you any other thoughts or comments before we move on to electronic voting okay if anything uh Jailai, can you tell me if I'm saying your name right? Yeah, that's correct. Wow, that was a total guess. <laughs> uh, total guess. 
uh, I, uh, I, I voted yes, but I'm concerning the scaling problem. I mean, uh, you, uh, using blockchain can definitely save our time and the uh, cost, but it will require all bank store the same uh, financial uh, uh, records uh, uh, repeatedly. Uh, so that will need a lot of computation power and also the stone age uh, uh, hardware. So I wonder about that problem. If we can solve this problem, uh, then the uh, bank, uh, the bank using blockchain will be a very good idea. So Jailai makes a really good point. Can you actually scale this business? If I send fifty dollars to Jailai, okay, maybe that'll work. But what if everyone in the United States, three hundred, four hundred million people? want to try to do it at the same time, can you do that? It can't. It doesn't have the processing power. It can't do transactions that quickly. So there could be a scaling issue with this. And then what happens? Would your, would your transactions be as slow as Western Union, which may take several days? It's fair enough to bring that point up. Thank you for that. Okay, now let's move on to electronic voting. Now this is an interesting one. So would anyone like to share with me your thoughts on what you think about using blockchain for electronic voting? Good idea, bad idea, good idea but needs to fix something. What do you think of it? Uh, Marcus and then Aida. Hi, Marcus. Hi, um, I cli uh, quite lo like the model they use, for example, in Estonia with um, voting in most government functions um, electronically and secured by blockchain. Because, I mean, there are lots of problems with um, elections later being challenged um, because their records can't be proven to be immutable and this could easily be solved with blockchain. Great, thank you. Aida, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I agree with Marcus. Uh, he cited the example of Estonia. Um, I would still be reluctant to use blockchain to vote because if something's happened, like a hack or I don't know, it's gonna just mess up with everything. And like voting is kind of important, so it would take more time to just uh, fix it. And you don't know if the results are biased, so you know, I would definitely not go with that. Okay, thank you, Aida. Uh, Thiago. Hi, Michael. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. I just think that it's not feasible right now because the way I see it, I don't know the Estonia case, but the way I see it, like, in order to be something that you can validate, you need to empower, like, the, the voting users. So the way I see is like you vote through your like through the machine over there or through your computer or your cell phone, but then uh, you need to have a receipt and also authorize and, and you be part of the blockchain. So we are talking about like the whole like population be able to receive the receipts and also to authorize the other transactions across the network. I think maybe, I don't, I don't know if I have a, like a clear view of how it could be like implemented, but like the voter needs to be part of the chain and needs to authorize and receive the receipt. So what I'm trying to say is that like, it's too much, it's a lot of users and it's a lot of peers across the globe. The scalability is very challenging. Uh, good point. And the way Estonia has figured it out is, let's say that uh, Tiago's a voter and Marcus is his boss. And Marcus hovers over Tiago and says, hey, you know, you work for me and I want you to vote for my candidate. I know that you don't like my candidate, but I do. And if you like your job, you're going to vote my way. So Tiago can vote for that candidate. Now, in the afternoon, Bo comes along, and Bo's going to bribe Tiago 100 euros to vote for a different candidate. Tiago takes the money. 
And then Daniel comes along in the afternoon and also is a briber and gives Tiago more money to vote a different way. And Tiago can take that money. The way Estonia works is that you, the voting is open for several days and it's only the final vote that counts. So it's Saturday night at 3 a.m. when Tiago should be home uh, all alone and people should not be bribing him and the boss shouldn't be there. His last and final vote is the real vote. And this gets rid of the boss hovering over you, influencing you, or someone trying to bribe you. Now, that is their security measure. However, Tiago brings up a, big, a good point that in Estonia, they had a problem with some of the older population voting 400 times because they thought the more they voted, they would get more people in there. But the system had to track all those transactions. In the United States, hundreds of millions of people. China, billions of people. How are you actually going to have a blockchain that can handle all those transactions when election day could be on the same day? So it becomes a valid question. Hey, I love electronic voting, but you know what? You just don't have the bandwidth to do it. Totally valid. So thank you for that, Tiago. Uh, Reza. Hi, Professor. Uh, I just wanted to add on that. Uh, like Matthias and uh, Frederick said in the chat, actually. Uh, so it's good for a uh, high participation of elections and good transparency. I totally agree with that. I think the only issue is, as with any blockchain, is the person who is um, putting in the block. So I'm kind of afraid. Uh, so in Estonia, they use the chip card, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of if, if if people are able to access uh, a block using somebody else's card. Uh, so it's not really uh, traceable if it's actually that person who is entering with that card particularly. Uh, but that's so far my only issue with blockchain, uh, using blockchain as a mean to vote. Um, and yeah, just, just in short, I think it's great actually, but small issues, just like okay. with any other blockchain. Thank you. Now, Razor brings up interesting valid points that this new technology may create new, new, new ways of corruption. However, a counter thought is, well, the current voting system has a lot of problems already. So are we going to hold ourselves up to the, the standard of perfection or better than what we already have? I don't know the answer to that. Yen, what do you think? Hi, um, I just wanted to kind of ask a question about um, fog computing. Um, what do you think that would do for the energy constraints that uh, blockchain is bringing upon? So fog computing, from my understanding, it should be using spare computing power in uh, homes and businesses mm -hmm. uh, to address that like costly use of energy. So how can it apply to Estonia? Do you think it, like, how would it work? Mean using energy for voting, um, using every like using the spare computing power of everyone else's like the leftover power that people are not using in their homes, transferring that power to the voting system to adjust. yeah the cloud the the cloud computing idea it it's nice that you can use someone's spare space so kind of like uh, I'm going to let you use the spare space in my basement to store some of your stuff well that's fine but you have to spend some energy to get it there and some energy to get it out. Also, one of the security measures on cloud computing is that let's say that you wrote a, a thesis of 30 pages. The idea would be you don't store those 30 pages on Marcus's computer that you're renting out, that Marcus might get one page, Tiago gets page two, Daniel gets page three, so they split it up so that if it gets hacked, no one can actually use the whole thing. So things like recipes, uh, you could do that. But there's an expense of energy to split it up, send it out, bring it back in and reassemble it. So I, I don't see it being, um, I think you'd be using extra energy to do that uh, in exchange for that added security. Understood, okay, thank you. Sure, uh, Tiago, I see your hand is up. Yeah, Michael, I just would like to add a final thought about yeah. like electronic voting because there in Brazil, where I came from, we, we are using electronic voting for several years. And there are a lot of humors about how reliable is the system because you go to the polls and then you vote 
and then you like you put your identity and like but you know do not receive any receipt about what candidate you vote you got a receipt that you voted that day and there are a lot of people speculating that maybe you can hack the system to like change the votes or the counting so we have this electronic equipment that record all the voting so the way i see that blockchain can be added is that on the way that you have a, like an electronic ID, a digital wallet, maybe through a QR code, and then like you go to the to the polls, then you vote in this electronic hardware, and then like you need to authorize, and then this this hardware or this server or this equipment communicates through your digital wallet, through your your cell phone, and of course, and when you go there, you can like also identify yourself through this QR code or something that is has in your digital wallet. And then you also, and then you like authorize, and then you receive a receipt about what candidate uh, about what candidate that you have voted, and you also can track that afterwards. So in that way, you ensure that anybody is going to change your vote, so it became part of the blockchain. So that's the way I see you can like use the blockchain, use a digital wallet for your identification. Be part of the systems, track your vote, and get your receipt. So maybe you get a token. Yeah. And you can spend your token, drop it in the candidate's bucket, theoretically. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's open, well, let's do some electronic voting on that note. So, yes, I want to use blockchain for voting, or no, I don't think it's a good idea. Yes or no. Polls close in 30 seconds. Okay, we have 25 yeses and two noes. Okay, beautiful. Let's move on to supply chain. And if you have any thoughts about the voting, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, they do count towards your participation. So using blockchain to monitor the supply chain, which includes food traceability. Good idea, bad idea, good idea that's not quite there yet. What are your thoughts on it? So we're not voting yet, but we are raising hands, making comments about what you individually think about blockchain in the supply chain space. Ada, would you like to give us your thoughts? Um, yeah, so... To me, it's a good idea uh, because, I mean, we can track where is the food coming from, especially, I don't know, for those who are really like picky with that, that they want to know what they're eating and um, if like it's organic and all this stuff, I think it could definitely help. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Marcus, what do you think? Um, in the UK, I've worked with a food supplement uh, company for a while and they have to uh, make sure that all their ingredients are trackable for FDA compliance, otherwise they wouldn't be allowed to sell, for example, in the US. And they actually introduced a blockchain-based system, a system two years ago and are quite happy with um, that. Oh, hey, so now who verifies the transactions on their blockchain? Um, I mean, the transactions are verified by the supplier sending them out and then again by um, the person um, receiving the stuff and then when they uh, manufacture um, their products or so put um, different ingredients together, then there are always multiple persons that um, formerly had to sign off everything on paper and now are um, doing this um, on the blockchain. I mean, I don't know exactly which um, kind of blockchain they're using. But it's a blockchain-based um, system on their smartphones. And um, this way, they try to ensure that everything will be always trackable and uh, traceable and compliant. Beautiful. Thank you. Any other thoughts on supply chain before we open up the polls? Tiago. Yeah, uh, I think it's a good idea. It's just, I just think that you cannot use blockchain itself. You need to combine it with other technologies and applications like IoT. 
in order to be able to track the goods or the products, you need to like uh, put like some intelligent device to track how long away the path from the supplier to the end customers. And then you used to use like electronic equipment, like a handheld like tracking systems to tag the products and the goods along the, the gate point to ensure the quality and what goods, if the goods are falling the path and, and do the quality control. So there is no way that it can use blockchain by itself. So maybe it's like just, add on a, a GPS tracker so you can see it going from the warehouse, traveling on the boat, going to San Francisco and something like that to add on to it? Yeah, you, you can do that, but you can do it more simple. For example, you can use like uh, uh, RFID tags. So you don't need to track like in real time. You just make sure that like when your your product is along the way, you just like make sure that you have a gate point that somebody is going to check that through a handheld equipment and like you scan that tag. And then you will connect that with a, a software platform, an application that will like authenticate that. Now, what Tiago's bringing up is interesting, is getting a human out of the verification process, that now you've got some computerized, digitized, putting in the RFID tag that, hey, if the thing doesn't get scanned, uh, we don't care whether you are honest or dishonest, you either scanned it or you didn't scan it. And this is an interesting way to make sure that your verifiers are trusted, because the human elephant, that the human element always ends up being the weak link in blockchain. Kuyen, what do you think? Thank you. Here. Um, I think another application for blockchain and supply chain is to give um, the farmers more, like empower them a bit more because right now, the problems that they're facing is that they have to go through intermediaries who might, you know, take some cut of the, of their profits or uh, might not, tell them the right market price. Um, and a lot of farmers actually don't have the option of interacting directly with the farmers, uh, with the customers, I mean, with their customers. So I think blockchain would help them reach out directly to customers and probably get more money than they're getting right now. Great, thank you. Any other thoughts before we open up the polls? Okay, do you like blockchain for supply chain? Yes, or you don't like it? No. Yes, if you like supply chain for blockchain, and no, if you don't like it. Okay, so we have 25 yeses and one no. Uh, the person that voted no, I love to get the no's because they can teach us something. Uh, the person that said no, would you be willing to open up your mic and share with us your thoughts? Because it might change the yeses. Yes, Jaylay. Uh, I mean, blockchain can really help the online part. Um, I mean, no one can uh, manipulate those data, but I'm concerning if the, when, uh, when like the manufacturing people, they uh, manipulate the data, when they import that, I mean the uh, the initial uh, phase, they put some uh, bad quality goods and describe it good. How can you? No one will supervise that. So the the initial data will be wrong, and the, and and then it will be recorded in the blockchain, and the other people have no ability to verify that. Um, I yeah, I worry about that. Great, thank you. So yeah, it comes back to the original problem. Once it's on the blockchain, it's written in stone, but how do you, it's garbage in, garbage out. You said you're gonna be sending me sunflower seeds, but what's the difference between sunflower seeds and sunflower seeds with bugs in it? How's blockchain gonna tell me that there's bugs there or not bugs there? So fair point, and that is one of the challenges. Now with that and with your projects, let's say that you're trying to get around that, Maybe you would add in, to Tiago's point, another technology. Maybe you take a picture of the sunflower seeds, rip open a bag to see that it's clean, 
or maybe you have a third party that does the verification. You might need to add in another layer in here that is going to say, yeah, the bag's actually 50 pounds and not 48 pounds and you're charging me for 50. And Frederick, yes, that will always be a problem. So this is one of the limitations of blockchain that it can't do everything for us. That once we get people who are trustworthy and are the verifiers, then we can go forward from there. So that does become a challenge. How do you make sure that the people verifying this data uh, are trustworthy? Okay, let's move on to medical record keeping. Uh, this is always a little hot button. Uh, raise your hand and share with me. Do you think electronic medical records on the blockchain is a good idea? Not a good idea? Something needs to be fixed with it? You can think of SWAT and DICE, one of the strengths of it, but maybe a threat that it creates. Maybe you should decrease something or eliminate something. Actually, let me flip it a little bit. What is a strength? I just want one strength of putting electronic medical records on a blockchain. Benjamin. Hello, Professor. Um, well, I'm talking from the perspective of the Spanish national health system where everything is in one database. And it allows every professional and all the healthcare professionals in the chain to access the data. And for example, you go to a doctor, you got a, a cold. So then you go to a pharmacy and that pharmacist can get the data and give you a better recommendation. So improves all the diagnosis from the beginning up to the end. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Benjamin. Welcome. So next person, raise your hand if you can share with me a weakness of electronic medical records. Any weaknesses? Raise a hand. Tiago. Yeah, the weakness is the security. Uh, like you don't want to your like medical data get spread over the internet and be hacked. So I think it's valuable to use blockchain to see, to ensure that your medical records is gonna be secured, right? And to add uh, about what Benjamin said, yeah, I think that's a great opportunity for some startups and companies that are investing on using digital analytics to ensure that all the patients have the right like uh, uh, medication and also improve that by suggesting additional ones and making the bridge between the doctor and the pharmacy and everything. But yeah, the thing is the security of your data. You don't want to, to have a breach in your data and your privacy of your medication, your diseases will spread over the internet. Okay, so uh, Tiago got a two for one. He gave the weakness of security but also the opportunity that, hey, when, when Michael McCarthy got prescribed some cholesterol medication, 50 milligrams, they cross-referenced the blockchain with other people who had my similar demographic and similar blood results and said, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't be giving him that drug. It should be a different cholesterol drug. And maybe that would pop up. So the opportunity that I could make sure that I wasn't prescribed incorrectly by checking other patients who are like me who got a different drug that actually had better results. So that could be an opportunity there, preventing me from going through two drugs. I get the good one the first time. Well, what's a threat? What's a threat of having my, my medical information on the blockchain? Tiago, you wanna take this one again? <laughs> uh, there, are, there isn't another hand up, so if you wanna try it, what could, uh, Vignesh, a threat? Hi, Professor. So I think the threat might be something to do with insurance because if you have so much of data, you can probably cross-reference who not to give insurance to. Ooh, yeah. Like I just got diagnosed with some horrible disease that's not going to kill me, but they're going to have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep me living. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a threat. Yeah, maybe that's just too much information, and maybe the insurance company is going to use that against me. Good point. Okay, so now let's dice electronic medical records. What is something that you could decrease 
about electronic medical records that would make it better, less of something. Vignesh. Access, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe if, a, if it's a life-threatening disease, that maybe my insurance company shouldn't have authorization to take a look at that diagnosis. Because that, that might, that decreasing that might get rid of the threat that I become uninsured. Thank you. Uh, increase, what's something that you might want to increase on electronic medical records to make them better? More of something. So imagine that your electronic, your records right now are with your doctor. Now imagine that they put them on the blockchain. You won't notice that. Is there something that you could increase that would make your life better? So right now, just the doctor can see it. Anything you'd want to increase with these features, just the doctor can see the data. Think about controlling your own data. Oh, Benjamin, knowing when your information's being updated. Yeah, what if, what if he says that he gave me an MRI on Monday and I never saw the guy? Overbilling, they do that with older people in nursing homes. So maybe increasing my patient access to my data, maybe increasing the alerts, or maybe allowing me to look at my own data instead of me having to request it from my doctor. So yeah, increasing the patient accessibility. What about create? Is there a feature that you could create with electronic medical records that isn't already there in the basic idea? Something you might want to create that you'd like? Reza. Uh, I think if it's on the blockchain anyway, I think it would be very easy for patients to get a second opinion if they, if they don't trust their doctor. Oh, like maybe creating a button on the app that says, hey, Second opinion, I didn't like that, that cancer diagnosis. Maybe the guy's wrong. Yeah, exactly. Or the treatment that the doctor is prescribing might be too harsh and you think there might be another way to do it. So Maybe create an alert with the insurance company that, hey, you know what? I, I'm not comfortable with, with what's going on. I think I, I'd like to have another set of eyes on this. Why, why do I keep getting sent for an x-ray every week? I don't get it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, beautiful. Uh, eliminate, is there something that you might want to eliminate with the electronic medical records as we understand them right now to make you like them more? Is there a feature you'd like to get rid of? Now remember, the weakness could be reduced if you eliminated the weakness. So think of the weakness that Tiago came up with, security. So something you could eliminate that would make it more secure? Any thoughts before we go to voting? What about eliminating the access to the insurance company? Maybe I don't like my insurance company and I just don't want them to have even more control over my life or if I could eliminate them, maybe they're not going to be able to call up my doctor and say, oh, don't give Michael drug A, it's too expensive. Give him drug B, which won't work as well, but it's cheaper, because they actually do that. And we have in the chat, how can we ensure that there are enough miners to validate any new medical records in the blockchain? Well, most of these electronic medical record blockchains are going to be uh, private, uh, permissioned. And that's going to be up to the hospital to make sure that there are enough people. If they don't have enough people, then the blockchain's not going to work. And if they're going to be investing that kind of money, they're going to have to make sure that they have enough people. So that's really going to become like a labor issue. Okay, so final vote of the day before we're done with the case study lecture portion. Vote yes, I like electronic medical records with the blockchain. Or no, don't like it. And you can also vote in the chat room. And 30 more seconds before we hack the poll. Okay, we've got 21 yeses and four no's. Beautiful. So would anyone who didn't like it, any of the four no's, care to raise their hand and share with us uh, why you don't like it?
maybe there's something that we haven't discussed that we're missing. Marcus. My main um, aspect here is the privacy concerns. I mean, in Germany, uh, my all my medical records are my own thing and no doctor can automatically access anything. And more, I mean, I, if I want a doctor to see anything, I have to carry, uh, bring it to him myself. And I quite like that system because this way no one can access it. And insurance companies can't access anything anyways in Germany. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. All right, so this concludes the lecture portion of today's live class. The next 30 minutes is going to be any students that want to chat with me about the individual project, the final project, their idea, uh, some challenges you have. So now we're going to be moving into uh, active participation on your applied project that you may need some help with. And so just raise a hand if you're all set or you want to chat with me privately and make an appointment on Canvas. I believe they've already set up the schedule for that. And again, I'm going to put in my email so you can talk to me privately. And my cell phone, which I love texting, so feel free to text and we can set up a time to chat if you want to chat. Uh, if you're all set, uh, you're welcome to leave class early. Otherwise, I will stay here to chat with the people that want to use this to talk about their applied projects. So anyone that has any thoughts, questions, concerns, uh, just raise your hand or put them into the private chat. Otherwise, I'll be seeing you in a few weeks in San Francisco. And remember, my job is to make sure you get an A. So if there's anything at all, reach out to me and I'm more than happy to help because this is actually fun for me, these projects. And I want to make sure these projects are something you can use somewhere else, like at a hackathon or actually start that business. So thank you for participating, and I'll stay for anyone that needs me. Uh, Reza, hi. Hi, Professor. Just one more question about the applied project um, yeah. as to how uh, granular does the presentation need to be, as in do we also need to discuss data strategy in terms of what kind of ecosystems are we going to use, or uh, does it have to be very um, basic in terms of what we want to achieve, what problem it will solve? Um, I just would like to know how deep do we have to go into detail? Well, you're going to have a 12-minute live presentation, so I, I would say medium level of granularity. So I would probably say what kind of blockchain we want to use. It's going to be permissioned or private. We want to use Hyperledger because we want to use smart contracts. So I would go on to that level. I would also take a look at how could you use the data and sell it for the benefit of the customer. Okay. So I would, yeah. I would dive into that, but also when I start to see your presentations as they take form, I might tell you to dive a little bit deeper, but I would say medium granularity. We don't need to like get into coding or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure, and uh, before I uh, talk to Ada, for uh, we had someone in the private chat say, could you explain a little bit more on how the group presentation will be formatted? Sure, it's 30 minutes in person in San Francisco with an audience of your cohorts. It's in three sections. Section one, five-minute video pitch. This is all on Canvas, by the way. And it's basically going to be like a, a standard pitch, problem, solution, how you make money. Then you have a 12-minute live presentation to me and the rest of the class showing on your slides business model Canvas, talking about each of those boxes, a SWOT analysis on one slide, dice analysis on another slide, and your blockchain checklist, how you got to yes. And then there's going to be a 10-minute Q&A with me and your cohorts. And everyone in the class is going to have the a venture capital question worksheet, which is going to be standard questions that venture capitalists uh, ask. And it's going to be in class in San Francisco. So I'm flying out there. So I hope that answers your question. If not, ask more questions while I talk to Aida. Hi, Aida. Hey, Professor. Uh, I just want to make sure, because I've been told that uh, topics we are no like we shouldn't use the the topics that are on 
canvas because it was for last year uh, blockchain class so i don't know if that's true i just wanted to uh that is not true the applied project is new and was never taught in the nano class and in the applied project when i give suggestions for basic ideas uh, that's never been done before those are just me throwing out ideas for you to consider uh, but you okay. can give me so st- oh sorry so we still can choose between social entrepreneurship and for profit like the oh, list yeah. that is there? okay yep that is a vicious rumor, but you know, you're boring if people aren't talking about you. So I guess we should be happy about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just wanted to make sure. So it's still, okay. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Uh, June. Hi, Professor. Hi. Yes. Oh, I have a general question. So we talk about the blockchain in different industries, but what is the motivation for all the users to use the blockchain is is my question so it, as we said last class it uh, add more cost for like the companies who want to pursue the new technology and also there are many um, regulation constraints uh, so I, I don't think this is uh, the, the technology problem that uh, blockchain is not uh, used in all the industries. It's more like um, social social constraints, not uh, the, the problem of the technology. So you're talking about, you know, what, why would the general public care about blockchain? Is that the basic idea? Yeah, so why the blockchain is not widely used right now I don't think it's the problem of the technology itself. I think uh, it's uh, like not all the people have the motivation to use it. Not all the people wants to, you know, change the existed way that they work because it's already convenient enough to transfer money between people or you can uh, trace your uh, goods from the like Amazon website. So I, I just feel like, um, People less uh, have less motivation to 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 make a change for their um, existed behavior. Okay. Well, basically, it makes things faster. It makes things cheaper. So, for example, let's say that you and I go shopping at Louis Vuitton, and I see a, a backpack that I want, and you go, "Oh, could be counterfeit," and I don't buy it because I'm like, "Oh, June said it might be counterfeit." And I don't know. Uh, but what if there's a QR code in there and I could just take out my phone and scan it and it says that it's real, then I, I feel, and now I can buy it with confidence and pride and say, yeah, it's real. Or maybe the same situation happens. Someone's trying to sell me that backpack on the street and you go, Hey, it might be fake. Well, the QR code can say to could say, Hey, it's fake. I'm not going to pay you a thousand dollars. I'll give you 10 bucks for it because it's not real. So maybe you could, save me on that end, basically for counterfeit products. That would be one, that I think is going to be one of the first reasons that consumers uh, start to actually use it. Counterfeit wine, there's more fake wine uh, of LF Roth, of Rothschild in the world than real wine. So maybe when I go to an auction, I don't want to buy a bottle of vinegar. I want to make sure that it's real before I buy it. So provenance issues and counterfeit products would be something that consumers would be interested in. But then the, uh, the, the shoppers, they need to uh, use the blockchain system, right? It adds more cost for the, for the shoppers who, um, right? They'd have to download an app that would be like, let's say like blockchain verifier. And it would say, yeah, the Louis Vuitton bag was made in France and it was sold to this store on Fifth Avenue in New York City. And they've had it for seven days. And I could be like, okay, it's real. But yeah, you're right. Uh, if you don't have any technology at all, blockchain is not going to help you at all. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Okay, sure. So Jim brings up a good point. Uh, blockchain will improve your life a bit, but you can live without it. Anybody else? Raymond. Hi, Raymond. Hi, Professor. Uh, good, good afternoon. I just a quick question about the quiz on Friday. I know how that will happen. Uh, the quiz is going to be opened up at a particular time. Take a look at Canvas. Just read modules, I believe, one through four. 
So it's at the end of that last module, I think it's module four, uh, the quiz will come on. And as long as you read the assigned material, you'll do well on the quiz. You don't have to look at the optional material to do well on the quiz. And it's only 10 questions, nine uh, multiple choice. And then the last one, you're, you're writing in an answer that I read. Okay, so the last one is an essay, right? And it's a couple sentences. Okay, okay. Yeah, and short it's, essay. Okay. You, you can write longer if you want. I love to read. Oh, <laughs> uh, like. okay, uh, I'll try that. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Sure. Anybody else? Kian, hi. Hi, Professor. Um, I, I, and I'm not sure if you covered this yet or if you mentioned this, but I can't seem to find the um, presentation information on the assignment page. I went on to the assignment itself, but it says that nothing's been published yet. I'm just wondering if maybe there was a glitch on your side or, or if we're not seeing it. Uh, let me take a look. Uh, has, is anyone having a similar experience to Kian? Let me see if it's published. Let me. See. I'm going to go to student view because I get the instructor view. Bear with me one second. I have to leave Zoom for a second. You can still hear me, but I won't be able to see you. Give me a second here. Okay. Home. Uh, Kuyin, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I see that the final project topic approval to February 14th, uh, that's open. Yeah. Do you see that? Okay. Final team assignment, A1 final team project, I see that published. Oh. Um, it's still saying it's part of an unpublished module and it's not available yet. Let me take a look at student view because this is what you see. Okay. Now, I see it right below the SWOT and DICE case study under A1. Oh, yes, yes, it's assignment part of unpolished, not, not viewable yet. Okay, I see what you're seeing. Okay, I will send a email. Uh, they, may, they, they know more than I do over there, so I'll ask them uh, if there's going to be a timeline on one that gets published. But basically, what you're going to see when it's published is what I've already told you in class, but you'll be able to see it in writing. Right. Okay, but I will, I'll send that email off and ask them if, uh, what's up on that. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, sure, thank you. I look forward to seeing you all in San Francisco. Anybody else? Uh, Darian. Hi, Professor, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, for the last one, because um, one of the topic is using blockchain to profitably bank low income individuals. Mm -hmm. Like, can you elaborate more on the low income? Because is it like someone who doesn't have any money at all, or? Uh, yeah, I came up with this idea for people who were in refugee camps that if they had access to smartphones, they could do uh, what's called micro work, 
Like, you know, when you try to verify a website where it says click on all the stop signs you see in, the, in these six images, mm -hmm. uh, they actually need a human to say that that's a stop sign in the picture. So you could take that uh, where people are getting work uh, electronically, or maybe they're doing work where they get paid in tokens on the blockchain. Because okay. uh, they're actually putting people's money on the blockchain in a refugee camp in Jordan. And to protect them from, let's say, uh, theft or losing the money, uh, it's all in an account on the blockchain, and their retina scan uh, will debit the account. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Okay, I will see you all in a few weeks. Please reach out to me by telephone or email. I'm going to stop.